Hello, welcome to the world of Word. Coming up, another word in your attic. And if you enjoy this, visit our Patreon to find out more about our exclusives and our general work of national importance. The link is in the notes below. And now, on with the show. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Well, this is great. We are fantastically thrilled to be joined by a rock journalistic legend, biographer and ukulele impresario, Sylvie Simmons. Sylvie, it's great to see you. Where, where do we join you? Where are you now? Well, I'm in San Francisco in the Mission District, hiding in a way in a little cubby hole at the back because there's people throwing sticks of dynamite out front and uh, it's a little noisy. Sticks of oh, dynamite? Dude. It's the new thing with the kids. They've got these small sticks of dynamite. It scares the life out of me, I tell you. Well, just, this is just purely for larks? It's not a, it's not a political yeah. protest? It's just to upset Frolic people? Frolicking children now have sticks of dynamite. It's <laughs> God, God. God, that makes Chiswick seem a bit quiet. Possibly a bit dull, actually. <laughs> Always a bit quiet, even when I lived in London. <laughs> Amazing. So oh, the, well, mission, the mission district remind me. The Mission District, down near the water? Well, we're kind of sort of fairly everything's nearish the water, but no, it's nowhere near the water. It, it's the kind of oh, okay. neighbourhood it was initially, and then it became gentrified like a lot of places. So it's an interesting mix. It's got the best taquerias in the whole world, except that right now they're all closed because of the coronavirus. Right. We've got shops opening here. I've just been down to the high road today, and the shops are open. It's, it's extraordinary. Things are getting back to normal, but well, we ahead of you. I guess we probably are. I think it always was ahead of America. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. In many ways. <laughs> that's true. So, how is the, how, how have you been occupying yourself during lockdown? Apart from uh, I noticed promoting those wonderful Toya and Robert Fripp uh, um, video clips of them in their lockdown kitchen. Not they brilliant. It gives marriage a good name, it really does. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> my husband, just so that I can kind of dance in the kitchen. And I used to tap dance on stage when I was a kid. I, there was actually an article on me in the Islington Gazette with a little picture of me that said, Islington's Shirley Temple. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, that's great. It was downhill from there. <laughs> So you haven't kept the clipping to show us or anything like that? I thought you'd have that. Think of like pulling that one out of there. Basically, just imagine as I look now, but with curly hair, my mother used to perm my hair so that I would have ringlets like Shirley Temple. This would now be called child abuse. Yes. <laughs> and those awful metal rollers. And I would get up and sing all of those oldie songs like, you know, Pennies from Heaven and, and kind of old American standards. So, oh, very good. Do you mean, does that mean to, I'm not going to make you sing it, but does that mean to say you know on the good ship lollipop? You could do the, you could do the full Shirley Temple repertoire. They didn't actually make me do that one. I think probably the time I thought was my delightful moment, but now I imagine it's probably the most embarrassing moment imaginable was uh, when I was the, the soloist on Teddy Bear's Picnic, for which I wore a teddy bear outfit. Mark this and I won't fantastic. have a word said against Teddy Bear's Picnic. I love the Teddy Bear's Picnic. We the original record is a masterpiece. Brilliant. It's a masterpiece, but it's also deeply, deeply disturbing and sinister. We think it's you know, <laughs> it, really it gives, it gives children nightmares. I blame that for how I discovered Motley Crue. You know, it was my way of kind of dealing with the devil that was inside of me post Teddy Bear's Picnic. I'm sorry, God, I'll make up for it. So what are you what are you what are you up to at the moment? What how are you spending your time? Well, right now it's been busy because my uh, second album is coming out in two months, and I've been waiting quite a while because the record companies everywhere, especially in the more indie kind of music world, are wondering what to do when the normal promotion thing, which is to go on tour, is not available. You know, and people I think are are being enthusiastic about digital concerts but after a while i guess there's so many people up there with their guitar and you know kind of just got up face and singing after you've seen how great their hair is my hair's grown so long i have to tie it back <laughs> my waist i'm like a hillbilly hair do but after a little while with that you just want to go to a concert and 
hear other people's responses and like sort of smell the air and have a drink and have your feet stick to the floor. There's something more to a concert than just a person on stage with an instrument and the musicians know that, but what can they do? You know, their hands are tied. Yeah. Explain how you got into this. I remember seeing you with Leonard Cohen book, A Man Came Out, and you did half the show kind of talking about the book, and then the other half of the show you got the ukulele out and played fabulously, played, um, you know, famously Raincoat and stuff. So was that the beginning of your career as a, as a musician? Because you had that album out, Sylvie, wasn't it? And you've now got a three-album deal. Is that, is that how that all came about? Kind of, yes. It, w it was kind of strange. I mean, I, I went on stage... Uh, one of the stories I was going to tell about one of my choices of albums is that, you know, as a kid, I'd sort of absorbed albums like Joni Mitchell's Blue. It was definitely my kind of thing, other than that, of course, I couldn't play you know, her wonderful tunings. And I went on stage uh, in a pub and there was a huge audience. It was like my Woodstock at the time of like eight people. <laughs> yeah, you know, kind of many sweaters who had been out in the rain and, and they had their big beer mugs and they were looking at me and there was beer on their beads and uh, beer on their beards. And I was on the stage and I started to sing this Johnny Mitchell song, which was my opening number, and I froze. It was like, mm, this is just terrifying. These people are looking at me, this huge crowd of eight. And so, you know, it didn't matter to me when I was on stage in teddy bear outfits. That seemed to, you know, I didn't think of incorporating that into my singer-songwriter act. <laughs> nowhere because all of those songs were in either a minor or d minor and <laughs> i don't think there was a major chord in any of them and they were mostly droning about my unhappy life and so i think i saved the world from a lot of extremely bad songs by waiting for another 35 years before <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but it oh, was impossibly modest <laughs> <laughs> but the leonard cohen book had a lot to do with it you know after spending years writing that huge tome and having absorbed Leonard Cohen's music completely through, through my life. I was a bit of a sort of human Leonard Cohen jukebox and I only had a ukulele at the time. I'd left all my instruments in England when I came out here and took a while before I brought them back out. Now I hate them all because I like the ukulele so much. So I took the uke on the road and, and just thought, well, people get bored with you reading things, you know? So I thought, well, I could sing songs, and it was like shy at first. And with there was actually a, a video online of me singing. A friend of mine, Rob Laufer, joined in and played beautiful guitar. And my face is like pale and like a bit worried and nervous smiles. But as the tour went on, you know, and it lasted over a year, I just thought, okay, I can do this. And then one of my friends, Hal Gelb from the group Giant Sand, a sort of indie Americana band that's been going since the 80s. Yeah, I know. They said, like, we need to do an album of your songs because he knew I wrote my own stuff. And finally, I guess uh, that happened. Really? See, first of all, you were just, you were doing the normal kind of book promotion tour mm -hmm. in a bookshop and so forth, but you were pulling out the ukulele and, um, and entertaining it kind of during the while you were talking about Leonard Cohen? Actually, I kind of came in, the ukulele was in my arms pretty much the whole time because it was a sort of like a security blanket. Yeah, know? sure. You know, it's hard to hide behind a ukulele. I'm only five foot two, so I actually can hide behind a ukulele. Right, right, right. But, you know, there's this thing that you have that's other than your book where you're looking for all your post-it notes. And I don't know if it's the same with you with book, note, uh, book tours, but usually my book is so full of post-it notes, you can't find anything because... I can never find anything to read at all, so I just don't bother. Because I've, I've marked stuff, I lose it or whatever. I just don't bother reading anything. It doesn't work for me. It's like, you know, I had, when I was a kid, I went to a, a, an old girls school where we had a little prayer book that we had. And my prayer book was like four times thicker than everybody's because out of my copies of uh, the Beatles Monthly, I used to tear out pictures of John, my beloved, and put them all between the sort of pages of the hymn books. So my uh, Leonard Cohen book was full of like notes and, and you can read a bit of this, you can read a bit of that. And so uh, I would just have it with me. And it got to where people would ask me to bring the uke. I'd get asked to these kind of academic institutions or to the you know, sort of Jewish museums to talk. And they'd say, oh, you're bringing the ukulele, aren't you? So it would just sit there with its little stand. 
you know, like crazy kind of conjoined twin that I've managed to cut off briefly. <laughs> See, the beauty of the ukulele is it's a non-threatening musical instrument. Somebody taking the stage with a ukulele, I would say, is not going to bore you. They're not going not to play anything very long or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? It, it's got the promise of entertainment with the ukulele that doesn't exist with a piano or a full-size guitar or whatever. That's my theory. I don't know if you'd agree with that. That's a very good theory, and it feeds into my other theory, which is that, you know, if you go up with a guitar, I think that most people, especially most men, think, impress me, you know, because I think men come with this kind of gradation gene where every a musician is on, they're going to say, oh, this is, is this better than this one? Or are you in yes. the top 50? You know, the Mojo syndrome of let's have yeah, another, yeah, yeah. you know, where I have them all time for first place in my brain, you know, I'm equal opportunity love when it comes to music. but. Um, the thing is, you go up there and mostly they're puzzled and the notes, uh, there's no real kind of sustain to it. You know, if I, if I get my guitar out and hit a string, it will, it will linger in the air. You hit it on a yoke and there's like, did somebody, is a fruit fly in the air? You know, did somebody come by and make a noise? But it's, it's, it's a lean forward thing as well, isn't it? Everybody, a ukulele comes and you know it's, you're not going to be bombarded with volume. Yeah, yeah. Lean forward. And also it's yeah. unpretentious. I think the other thing is, that, you know, there's something utterly sweet and affecting about ukuleles. I the Beatles, but all that generation, the, the beat group generation of the 60s, all loved them, didn't they? The, the Beatles all played ukuleles. Just sort of go out and buy them and put them in the back of his car just to hand out to people. I remember interviewing Tom Petty for Mojo and him showing me a pile of, you know, of these ukes that, uh, that, you know, George had left behind. And there was always a smile on people's face when they talk about the uke. I think the only problem with them is they can be a little twee. You know, sometimes you think, oh, you know, is this going to be too precious, you know? Tiny but, Tim gave them a bad reputation yeah, at one time. It's a but risk worth from taking. That. It's a risk worth taking in the tweeness. I'll, I'll deal with I'll take that any time, any time of day. So you've got a huge number of CDs behind you. When you, when you move to the States, and you take everything with you? Or is that stuff that you've kind of grown while you've been there or what? It's, it's um, me and my stuff is funny because I often move. I have a habit of moving to different countries. And it's not because I'm on the run. Oh, actually, I am, but don't tell anyone. But it's kind of like I leave stuff for a while and I live like a monk for you know, a studio apartment for a little while and then I start jonesing for all of my stuff, which I'm paying a fortune to keep everywhere. And so, yes, it's gone everywhere. You know, it started off in London. If I was pointing the other direction, which would make for bad light, we've got all of the LPs and uh, then there's another room full of all the books. So it is a madness. You know, I'm a monk with just a huge amount of stuff around me. Have you got any particular ones you're going to pull out in, a, in, a, in, a, in our kind of show and tell format here? I was advised before to do so. So I actually got a couple of little bits of memorabilia too. But uh, Oh, go on, the show us, yeah. show us. We should start with the beginning. The first album that I ever owned in the universe. Here it is, its actual copy. Uh, oh, you, well, you can't go wrong, Fantastic. you cannot go wrong. Can't what go a wrong. Great record. Oh yeah, and, and it was entirely written by them, wasn't it? Was it the first one entirely written by yeah. them? All the songs. Yeah, yeah. It was. I did an interview with George Martin, and he said it was pretty much all written by John. I kind of used to get a comic when I was a girl, you know, my kind of thing. My I didn't have pocket money at the time, uh, but it was. I used to have like something like Bunty, and then they put out a magazine called 208, and there was a picture of the Beatles on the cover. And at that moment, me being even pre-tween, just thought, this is it, this is my comic. So I had my weekly Fab 208, and then um, the film Hard Day's Night was shown at the cinema. So my big brother, who was a few years older, kind of had to walk me, holding my hand, and we went to an afternoon cinema thing. And I don't remember how I got this album. I mean, they're too, too big to steal. I mean, these days people steal music easily, but somebody must have given it to me for my birthday at some point later because i didn't you know even have any baby jobs and like you know cleaning and babysitting or anything to earn money but i got that and i still just go nuts with that opening chord you know fantastic fantastic chord 
it is it can stop the world and so i tell you it shows you how yeah, how young i was one second I hope i'm not leaning too provocatively over the screen here <laughs> oh that is <laughs> is that is is that your own work really? yeah. I had since I was a little girl. It was just there on the floor by my baby bed. Beatles rug. It's a rug. So, it's a rug. I thought it was a towel. Of us. That's absolutely brilliant. I thought it was going to be a Beatles bath mat. I thought that was probably the first yes. time we see that. It's yeah, a yeah, rug. Yeah. It's a fair. That's it's fabulous. Okay, well, so you, you you take that to the United States with you. <laughs> God knows what that costs to ship. Yeah. <laughs> rug and every. I got every copy of the Beatles monthly and oh what the Beatles dolls they died they were about this big they may even have come free with a magazine but I had all four of them and you had to <laughs> I have to be careful with this you you had to blow them up <laughs> and they they were all just like one piece you know one beetle thing but they had a little kind of a separate bit of moppy hair you know kind of plastic that was cut with scissors and everything. So that was a dear thing I had for years and they just, they died on me. But yeah. Oh, I, I loved that. The first thing I mentioned to the was for the first time at the, when I did a Cohen concert down, or Cohen uh, bookshop thing, his name is Rob Laufer and he's a really good LA singer songwriter. And he was the George in, I think, one of the Beatlemania things that was going on. He's a brilliant singer. And he says something to me that, was so true. He said that he was beetle damaged. And I feel in exactly the same way that when I listen to music, any music, it's almost like I'm filtering it through the music. You know, they're, they're my base position. They're my say oh and hold my belly and get back to my breath. The, the Beatles, I'm beetle damaged. All songs to me. Yeah, well, it's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. I mean, they spoil you for every other group, don't they, really? Because they're a terrible starting point because they made everybody think that they could do the same thing as the Beatles did, i.e. all write their own songs. And most groups couldn't do it at all. It didn't stop them doing it at all. But, uh, yeah. What else have you got, Sylvie? What have you got? Ah, uh, look at this. Like, well, it should be with two albums. Donovan. Oh, oh. well, Donovan. Was he your favourite? It's on the it's on the Marble Arch label. We've had we so many it. Marble Arch records. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gift from a flower oh, to a garden. That is a fantastic record. No, it's not. Right? Oh, it is. Sorry. <laughs> oh dear. Um, <laughs> How interesting. Um, I went to this girls' school, as mentioned, and, uh, I, you know, I loved music my whole life, but I hated these kind of music lessons that we had uh, because mostly they were about kind of English folk, the finger in your ear kind of stuff, and country dancing, which was a true hideousness because it was two girls dancing, and it was, you know, it was so weird. So I, um, I'm sorry if you like dancing with girls, it's not weird, but we <laughs> <laughs> young girl trying to do like Scottish dancing <laughs> it's, it's weird so uh, I hated folk music and my older brother um, had got, had a Bob Dylan albums that he loved and I kind of liked him at that time you know, it was those early ones but then I heard Donovan and I heard at the same time pretty much incredible string band so that was my folk music those two but I chose Donovan because he was there was something about him. I mean, if you do a kind of Donovan Dylan comparison, okay, D Dylan is Mount Everest. He's the Nobel Prize winner. He is special beyond all thought. But there was something kind of harsh about those early words. And Donovan was just so earnest and sweet. And I was a little girl. I liked mm -hmm. earnest. So mm -hmm. I loved his stuff. And I went to a concert of his that was at the Royal Festival Hall. I'll never forget it. I didn't go to many concerts when I was young. I had to save up, you know, from work money, you know, for helping out with chores and things. But the opening act was Tyrannosaurus Rex. All right, there you go. Brilliant. The big revelation to me of these two on the bill was they both wore the same shoes, Mark Bolan and Donovan, which were Mary Janes. 
which of course I didn't know about marijuana, so I didn't think of that sort of Mary Jane. But it was these round toe shoes with a little strap on. So for the longest time, my fashion shoe of choice was Mary Jane's. And <laughs> that is probably the only time that shoes of that sort will ever be mentioned on your, your blog. You never know. You absolutely never know. But okay, we'll take your word for it. What else you got there? This is brilliant stuff. Yeah. Oh, what were I getting this? Ah, yes. Another original, untouched. And I've got some merch. Oh, oh fabulous. Uh, Although, let's be honest, isn't that so tragic, that cover? I, can, I never believed that a record <laughs> that great can have a picture that's just a snap taken in a zoo. You know, I mean, it's just hopeless, isn't it? Do you think that came out around the time of Revolver, you know? You know, it, that, you know, compared with all the British bands I was in love with, I mean, this is the first American band I've come up with. At the time, when I was a kid, and I guess you guys were kids too, there was, there was almost like this conveyor belt of genius that we just took for granted. But, you know, I love the Beatles and, oh, the Stones, I love the Stones. There's the Kinks. Jeez, I really love the Kinks. The Who? This just kept on and on and on. But then there were the Beach Boys and... I think the first song I heard of theirs was Surfer Girl, and I loved it because I loved sad songs with that sort of progression of those 60s kind of, you know, bar with a, a mirror ball and that sort of feel to them. And I think the first single of theirs I bought was I Get Around. I don't know why that was the first, you know, maybe it was on offer, <laughs> I have no idea. But I got that, but then I started really getting into them and the sad songs. And I have my guitar and I love sad songs, still do. And I hear all those songs like In My Room and God Only Knows and Caroline. I mean, these gorgeous, gorgeous, heartbreaking songs with amazing arrangements. So I love them. And the I early Beach Boys were like the greatest advertisement for America imaginable if you lived in England like we did. Didn't you think? You just think, I have to get to this country. Exactly. So I did. I moved out to L.A. in 77 and I went and interviewed the, the Beach Boys. And... Um, <laughs> I learned to love uh, uh, Brian straight away and really dislike Mike Love straight away. Um, I should have loved Brian, but he actually ran out of the room when I went in to interview him. <laughs> Nick Kent mentions it in one of his stories. <laughs> he, what, was it this dark stuff book? Uh, he did. I think, don't think he mentioned my name, but I was actually he ran out. He was just scared. It was one of those Brian's back things, you know, where Brian... If people don't know the Beach Boys, around the time of Pet Sounds, Brian was too scared to go on the road. He was very nervous. He had mental conditions that unfortunately got worse for some time. And they would keep trying to drag him back because he was the hit maker. However much mm. I've loved the name of the Beach Boys, um, it was Brian's band. So I went to this strange show, which was held at uh, in the University of California at Davis. And they had a kind of, one of these, like, it was almost like a flatbed truck. They were playing on that. And Brian was at the keyboards in the corner looking terrified, as he did when I walked into the room to try and interview him. He ran away. I have that effect on boys, what can I say? But there <laughs> was a swag that we got, as we in the business call it. I've used it a lot, so it's not in the best of conditions. They are thinking, what can this possibly be? Go on. This is my Beach Boys beach towel. Oh, oh this very is perfect. This oh, is that's absolutely want. perfect. Genius piece of marketing. 1979. Can oh, fabulous. Taller than I am. That is absolutely fantastic. And well used. <laughs> I'm delighted you kept that stuff. It's wonderful to see. What else you got there? Oh, okay, next one. Oh, wow. <laughs> Paranoid. <laughs> Terrific. Oh, yes. I can, rem so I can where, still remember you interviewing, you interviewed Ozzy Osbourne in Sounds. I can remember in 1979. I can still remember it. After, 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 after he left the Sounds. But tell us about that. Why do you like that so much? Well, I think that I thought my take on it, because I could never choose like my favourite albums of all time. I mean, otherwise, you know, I'd be putting in everything that's on this wall right now, pretty much, you know. Uh, 
it was one of the things I suppose that had some sort of effect on my life because uh, when I went out to uh, LA to start uh, writing about music, I did it off my own bat, but almost immediately I became correspondent with Sounds Magazine on the grounds that the first uh, band that I interviewed when I landed <laughs> was Queenie Dan, and they were really nice to me, I guess. I thought it was amusing, this small child coming in, <laughs> this little girl that they thought they could corrupt but didn't quite manage to, um, that they would give me a good interview and I took pictures of them as well. And so I was writing for Sounds and then in 1978, Alan Lewis sent me on, who was the editor at the time, yeah. sent me on the road with Black Sabbath. Can you imagine? <laughs> with a metal band. And it was a really, really fantastic time. It was the first time I'd experienced actually kind of going on the road and also, you know, kind of traveling with a band, but also how gentlemanly the British heavy metal bands were, you know, to a girl. The American ones, not so much, but you know, all of those, they're kind of they were really sweet. They just treated you like a little sister and made you make the tea, you know? Is there any biscuits with that love? It would be more like that. So I went on the road with Black Sabbath and around that time, sounds I st was starting to get more metal in. And uh, when Jeff Barton became editor of Sounds, he uh, had a spin-off magazine called Kerrang. And so wow. as Lord Canyon, which was uh, that magazine in the beginning, I was writing more and more about metal. And really, I think that the only metal uh, sorry, album I'd ever bought was that one. <laughs> at least in my collection, that's the only one I could find. So, <laughs> Led Zeppelin, I loved, you know, kind of bands that played heavier rock. But, you know, I became a bit of a kind of metal writer for a considerable amount of time after that. Well, it's always it's always colourful stuff to write about, isn't it? If you go on the road with bands like that, you're going to get things to write about, aren't you? That's very true. But I think actually, when I was still um, writing some things for the Guardian, and if you're listening, Guardian, please help. Me. I miss you. But when I was writing stuff for that, they sent me on the road with the Motley Crue reunion. Everything was going fine until they arrested the dwarf. <laughs> oh yes. Absolutely. You see? That is it's, absolutely... It's a gift. It writes you, itself from that point You go on. back to the office, you tell them yeah. that line, and you, they, they, you know, they, they liberate six pages, don't they? You know, it's, it's absolutely fine. It's done deal. That's brilliant. Can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. What else you got there? Ah, actually, what? I forgot to show this before, so this is a step back. Yeah, example. yeah. Program. I bought the program for Donovan at the... Oh, uh, right. Royal Albert Hall, so that was another thing. Now the next one is ah. no, of course, Joni Mitchell. Blue. Of course, Blue by Joni Mitchell. Um, actually, my new album's called Blue on Blue with the same blue cover. All uh, oh, right. You know, I'm stealing the blue idea because it's so perfect. But that really, there's no actual stories behind it. I did interview her. Um, I interviewed her back in the day. She wouldn't speak to me for my Leonard Cohen book, but um, which was very, very sad because it's interesting. That was the first um, relationship, romantic relationship that Leonard had had with somebody who was as good a writer as he was. And yeah, was yeah. Songs at the same time about him while he was writing yes. songs about this him. Is well, that's what fascinates me about a whole lot. James Taylor, Chris Christopherson, all those people, Cat Stevens, Carly Simon, they, they were leaping in and out of bed with each other and all writing songs about it, weren't they? Just about no exceptions. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary time. I we shall never see it again. I did an interview with Leonard Cohen. He's talking about living with Joni Mitchell. I, I, I'm sure he must have said the same thing to you. And he said that she was prodigiously talented. And he, he, he was obviously threatened and unsettled by that. He found that quite hard. I mean, Graham Nash, you would have seen interviews with Graham Nash. Graham Nash pretty much felt like giving up, didn't he? He thought, well, my God, story. this woman gets out of bed in the morning and writes a masterpiece. You know? But the story about Graham Nash and Joni Mitchell, as he tells it in his book, is that when they met in Canada, I think, and they went back to his room, and she didn't just play him one song. She didn't just play him two. She played something like 12. That's right. Which is absolutely extraordinary. 
you know, the self-belief to do that in front of yeah, another At musician. no point saying, you're Graham Nash, do you want to play some of yours? <laughs> yes. <laughs> a bit rude, really, isn't it? <laughs> it's absolutely... You know, on the uh, Rolling Thunder tour and stuff that would come out fairly recently, where after the show in Toronto, they all went, uh, the Dillon crowd, all went back to um, Gordon Lightfoot's house. Oh, Gordon, love that fantastic scene with Roger McGuinn and Dylan. Oh! And they're sitting there is Joni, completely composed, acting like in front of an arena audience herself, and just sang one of the songs. <laughs> Coyote or one of those songs just through and everybody was wrapped. They all have <laughs> They but they must have been musicians. You know, you turn up with your guitar, intending to play your song, and there you go into the living room, and there's Joni Mitchell with the guitar. You must feel like turning on your heel and leaving. You know, pretending you've just thought of you. You should be somewhere else. Taxi. <laughs> <laughs> it's Terrible. Just a level of brilliance, but there was something about that. I loved the whole of that singer-songwriter movement. I was still a kid in London at that point. I wasn't a music journalist and I was buying all of those albums, you know, one after another, you know, the first James Taylor album. I kind of got bored with him after a while. I think it got a bit too sappy. You want a boy to have a little substance, you know. <laughs> you know, Jackson Brown, I got the whole sort of series of those. And uh, when I went out to LA, it was to live there. In a way, it was a combination of Beach Boys and that Laura Kent. Laurel Canyon scene, which is yeah. I said Laura Canyon from my <laughs> yeah. So you've got your you've got your your records coming out in a couple of months. You say you hope. Well, I'm sure it will do when this bloody war is over, um, as we say. Are you working on any, any books? Um, no, not right now. I um, I was working with Debbie Harry on her memoir Face It that came out last year. And so I kind of put books aside for a minute and you know, so I keep having ideas and they pop into my head. But the thing about books, at least with me, I don't know if it's the same with everybody, is they tend to take over my existence and it's kind of you sleep, you, you do everything with that person in your mind. When I was doing the Leonard Cohen book, he kind of entirely lived in my brain and I remember doing an interview with the Canadian kind of newspapers, you know, up there, he is a god. And so all of the big ones wanted to talk to me. And my book had come out at the same time as a, a biography had come out of uh, a, a sort of a guy who was a really a huge guy in the military in the US and his biographer was female and she had slept with me. And, and, stuff. <laughs> and so I remember one of these people from the Globe and Mail Canada or something saying to me, did you sleep with Leonard Cohen? Oh, and, I just, and I said, like, he lived, he's lived in my head for so much for the last three years. It'd be like sleeping with myself, you know. <laughs> for God's sake, it was That's kind of... That's an extraordinary question to ask somebody, isn't it, really? That's, that is pretty fresh, actually, isn't it? <laughs> We've never been fresh. asked that, Dave, have we, about interviewing <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. It's wrong. <laughs> Very wrong. That's I'm like, just kind of asking, because you've interviewed so many people. You've interviewed Little Richard. You've interviewed, um, you know, Zappa. You know, you've interviewed, um, you know, Johnny Cash. You know, I mean, of all of those, this is a very kind of corny question, I know, but of all of those, was there anybody who was particularly memorable or charismatic? I was never slept with any of them. No, right, right, quite, quite. Uh, yeah, well, Johnny Cash was probably the most memorable assignment of my life. Um, I spent a week with him um, about six weeks before he died and six weeks oh, after really? Cash's wife died. Um, I honestly believe that Johnny Cash would never have said, Paul Sylvie, bring her over to Nashville, or actually out to Hendersonville where he had his house. It was all the doings of um, his producer, Rick Rubin. Uh, Rick and I had had a sort of friendly relationship for some while. He would always call up and talk about music. He was a complete music nerd. And I guess back when I was working even at Sounds, he gave me a call once in a while just to chat. And, um, he had got the idea at that time of signing Johnny Cash, which was great. And then later, you know, after having a huge success with his work with Johnny Cash uh, for many years, you know, 10 years, they'd got uh, Grammy, you know, best album awards for every single thing he did with Johnny Cash. 
um, he said, I've got an idea of doing this 10 year anniversary album and, uh, you know, doing the best of the stuff that we put over the 10 years, plus all the outtakes, because there's hundreds of them and we can have some of those. And I feel like maybe doing a, a little a book with it, like a little hardback book. What do you think? I said, that sounds a good idea. And he said, well, will you do it? <laughs> it's like, oh, yes. And unfortunately, um, at the time he'd asked was when June Carter was becoming ill. And then June died and I assumed that the project was over, that he would soon follow. But in fact, he had called up, uh, Johnny had called up his producer and said, look, send her out because the only way I can get through this is working. Um, so here yeah. I am, the leading man at his house, you know, he's, um, there was always somebody over, one of his daughters would come in, you know, one day it was Roseanne Cash, one was it with others, it was other daughters that maybe you don't know. Colleen, I don't think, turned up during my time there. But it was amazing, he had a doctor that came in to try and treat him every day. He was in, in a really bad state of health physically. He looked like he'd been in a ring with Muhammad Ali or something. His face uh. was bruised and beaten up at the same time. He had big, big rings around his eyes. He could hardly see from glaucoma and he was in a wheelchair. But his spirit, his fighting spirit yeah. was amazing. And every afternoon he was in a studio in his house, in a room where it used to be his kind of bachelor pad place where he, had, he still had his circular bed with like animal skins. Kind oh. of. <laughs> <laughs> he on the wall. Here was a coyote, here's a squirrel or whatever. Sorry if I've got the wrong animal. But um, he went in there every day with a whole bunch of men, you know, his boyfriends and uh, did male friends and did some recording. He couldn't play guitar at that point because his hands were shaking from his policy. But it was really good. And I was just there to get the Coca-Cola, just like I got the, you know, the cups of tea on the metal tours. I got the cold Coca-Cola out of the fridge to clear his throat and occasionally to write things down and kind of just be a general helper because if you're at somebody's house at that time, you know, you join in, you take out the trash. Mm, mm. Oh, well, it's extraordinary memories, extraordinary. Amazing. Sylvia, it's been delightful talking to you. Uh, it, it's lovely to be able to, you know, reach out across the, uh, hands across the ocean, all the way to San Francisco. Uh, what do you, what do you, your day is just starting, ours is, ours is an ending. What are you doing for the rest of the day? Do you know or you, you stay there? I've got a review I have to write for Mojo and I've got a whole bunch of little things to do of kind of homework for the album coming out. You know, it's all about like sending out press releases and, you know, kind right. of things or, or whatever else. So that's the kind of the part that's quite so pleasant, which is that, you know, the glorious self-promotion that very few people seem to actually <laughs> Like, but most time could take a stiff drink if it wasn't first thing in the morning and get on with it. So that's my main thing right now. And otherwise, okay. it's like watching Netflix. I'm on a detectorist right now. I've just started a detectorist. Oh, okay. Can't, oh, go, wrong can't go wrong with that. Can't go wrong with that. Very good. It. It's very good lockdown viewing, actually, it detectorist. It's very, uh, yeah, it's very warming. So, <laughs> Sylvie, it's been lovely to talk to you. In lovely to talk Fantastic to you. to see you. And uh, we'll, we'll see you back in Blighty at some point in the near future, we hope. <laughs> Safely. Take care, you guys. It's really lovely. You Cheers. Too. Brilliant to Cheers. see you. Bye.